I want you to take your Bible to Proverbs, your iPad, your iPhone, uh, either search or swipe. It really doesn't matter. We're going to go the same place. Proverbs 20, 18, verse 22. Look what the Bible says. It says, Whosoever findeth a wife findeth a good thing. Amen? Whosoever findeth, no, not a bad thing. You found a good thing. Amen? Whosoever findeth the wife findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor of the Lord. Let us pray. Jesus, we love you. I pray you'll speak to us and through us. God, meet the needs of your people. And for all you do, we're going to give you glory, honor, and praise. For I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. I want to take a few moments, and I want to talk to you about men, we need our wives. Men, we need our wives. And all the women said, amen. Amen. I heard about a man that was married for uh, 44 years. And one day he looked at his wife and he said, Honey, 44 years ago we had a cheap apartment, uh, a cheap car. It was a Vega with a aluminum block. <laughs> I, we slept on a sofa bed and watched a 10-inch black and white TV. But I slept with a hot 23-year-old mama every night. He said, now we have a nice car, a nice house, a big bed, flat screen TV, but I'm sleeping with a 67-year-old woman. Kind of seems like you're not holding up your end of the things. (laughs) The wife, being a very reasonable woman, said this. She said, "Uh, you go out and find you a hot 23-year-old woman blonde and I'll make sure that once again you're living in a cheap apartment (laughs) driving a cheap car and sleeping on a sofa bed amen well I, I truly believe that women don't understand how unique and how special the role that they have in their husband's lives. I'm convinced most don't realize how important that role really is. And what I want us to do today, I want us to take the Bible, and I want you to see some things that that I learned recently. These are things, this is not something, this is not something I preached three years ago or five years ago or a month ago. It's something that, that I'm learning. I want you to notice something. In Genesis 1 and 2, look what the Bible says. And the earth was without form. And void and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God. See, folks, that's Genesis 1 and 2. In the very beginning, it was God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Three in one. Now, that word spirit, the Bible was written in Hebrew. That's why somebody says, well, I'm a King James only man. That's okay. I preach out of the King James Version. But you got to understand, they were 15 translations before the King James Vern. <laughs> I'm just being honest. It's a translation. It's whatever translation you use. I mean, I'm not. But if you said, no, I want the original, you'd have to have Hebrew. And the problem is you can't read Hebrew. But when the Bible was written, it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. Now, that word spirit was actually the Hebrew word ruach, R-U-A-C-H. It means to breathe. The spirit of God was the breath of God, the breath of God. Now, notice what the Bible says in Genesis 2-7. And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils, the breath of life. That word, breathe, it's the word ruach. Breath and spirit, same word. So even in the beginning of time, 
God knew it was necessary for the Holy Spirit to be inside man. He knew with the first man, Adam, he needs the Spirit inside him. The Bible says, walk in the Spirit and you'll, you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. This is what I say, unless there is within us that which is above us, we'll soon yield to that which is around us. Unless there is within us that which is above us, we'll soon yield to that which is around us. You have no power in yourself. The power is through the Holy Spirit. The power, the victory, overcoming is not in your strength. It's through the Holy Spirit. And we can do all things through Christ, through the Holy Spirit. Now I want you to see Genesis 2.18. And the Lord said, it's not good that man should be alone. I'll make a help meet for him. That little word help, again, the Bible was written in Hebrew. A little Hebrew word, azar. A-Z-A-R. Get that word. Help, azar. Now look what the Bible says. John 15 and 26. And when the helper comes, the word there, azar, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth. Get this. God used the same word for wife, help meet, as he used for the Holy Spirit. The same, now I'm not saying the wife is the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Some women want to be. I'm not saying the wife is the Holy Spirit. But I'm saying God used the same word. Now here's what I did. This was so fascinating to me. I said, what does azar mean? What does this little word A-Z-A-R mean? It has a twofold meaning. This is what it means. The power to accomplish a task. And secondly, to supply what is lacking. To supply what is lacking. God didn't create a woman to compete with man. She created a woman to complete a man. Here's what I want you to, men get this down. A man can never be everything that God intended him to be without his wife. A man can never be everything that God intended him to be without his wife. It's a partnership. Two become one. But get this, the wife is to have the qualities of the Holy Spirit. And this is what I want to say, wives. Do you resemble the Holy Spirit in your husband's life? Do you resemble the Holy Spirit in your husband's life? Now I began to think, what are the qualities of the Holy Spirit? The qualities of the Holy Spirit are the qualities that a wife should have in her husband's life. Number one, companion. Look what John 14 and 16 says. It says, the comforter will abide with you forever. The comforter will abide with you forever. A companion. What are the four greatest needs of a man? Every man, every, your husband. These are the four greatest needs of every man. Number one is respect. He needs respect more than he needs anything else. Number two is a physical relationship. A man comes to bed one night, he's got a glass of water and two Tylenol. And his wife says, honey, I don't have a headache. He said, gotcha. <laughs> it's a proven fact that men are, are wired that way. They're, they're more wired that way on days that begin with T. Tuesday, Thursday, 
today, tomorrow, Saturday, Sunday. All right. <laughs> the third need that every man has is friendship with his wife. Friendship with his wife. And, and number four is domestic support. But I go back to friendship with his wife. The Holy Spirit is our companion. He abides. He abides. You ask a man, who's your best friend? He'll say, my wife. Ask a woman, who's your best friend? Debbie. <laughs> a man and his wife, true story, were having some struggles. And one day she said to him, where are you going? He said, I'm going hunting. She said, I want to go with you. And he said, initially I had concern. Because he said, our home, there'd been a lot of, there'd been a lot of struggles. And he said, I was worried about was being alone with her with a firearm. There'd been a lot of struggles. <laughs> but he said, she went hunting with me. And he said, it so healed our marriage. This is what I'd say to you women. She came into his world. In whatever capacity, when's the last time you stepped into his world? You know, it's a proven fact that after three and a half years, no matter the marriage, we start taking each other for granted. After three and a half years, it's what the experts say. And what are some signs that, we take in, that we're taking each other for granted? Number one, we forget to say, I love you daily. Number two, we go to bed at different times. Number three, we forget to say thank you for dinner. And number four, we quit looking for things to do together. I just encourage you as a wife, step into his world in some capacity because the Holy Spirit is a companion. But I'll tell you something else. The Holy Spirit's not only a companion, the Holy Spirit is a comforter. He's a comforter. John 16 and 7 says, when the comforter is come, Acts 9 and 31 says, the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Every man, whether he'll admit it or not, wants comfort from his wife. And this is how you can comfort your husband. There's two things that a woman can do to comfort her husband. Number one, appreciation for his struggles. Appreciation for his struggles. You say, well, now, if he'll just tell me, tell me his problem, I'll fix it for him. No, no, no. He don't want you to fix it for him. Because the moment you fix it for him, you just said to him, I'm smarter than you are. And I'm the real leader. And if you'd come to me a long time ago, I could have taken care of this. He wants appreciation for his struggles. And then he wants affirmation that he can handle it. I know it's tough, honey. But you're going to handle it. See, folks, a man wants a woman's voice to be comforting. A man wants a woman's voice to be comforting. I thought about this illustration. When I was a little boy, I parted my hair over on the side. That's me right there. That's the lady who named me Benny. My mother had two children. She had no daddies. She had two children, no dads. And she goes to this lady, Jenny Travis, when I was just a baby, and she places me in Jenny Travis's hands, and she said, this is my baby, and I need you to help me with him. And Mammy said to Mama, what's his name? She said, his name is Vincent. His name is Vincent. Now, Mammy was just a southern poor lady, and Mammy, a church of God lady, she said, I can't pronounce Vincent, but I'll give him a name. Mama said, call him whatever you want to call him. She said, I'm going to call him Benny. And all my life, it's been Benny, 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 Benny. But I remember I stayed with Mammy. And then later I went back and started staying with my mother. And each day, my mother would pull my hair over on the side. And then she'd take those big cans. 
I can remember those big cans, and she'd spray my hair. A storm wouldn't have moved it. I mean, she would spray my hair. I mean, she'd spray my hair. And I'd go off to school with my hair that way. And I went that way. As, even as I started getting older, I still went to school the same way. I'd pull that hair over the side, and I would uh, spray it down just like Mama did. And finally, it went through an era. I don't know if it happened here, but it went through an era in the hills of Tennessee where they got into parting their hair in the middle. And they would feather it back. And everybody that was cool was feathering their hair back and they parted it in the middle. And I went to school and they said, you're dated. You're not cool. You're not like us. And I went home and I started crying. And I said, mama, they said, I'm not like them. They said, I'm not cool. They said, their hair looks good and my hair looks bad, mama. I said, mama, they said I was out of style. She said, son, why did they say you're out of style? I said, mama, because they said my hair wasn't parted in the middle. That was in style. She said, boy, let me tell you something. You go back to school tomorrow. You tell them a couple things. You tell them, first of all, that alfalfa has been dead for years. <laughs> and you tell them that you've got the prettiest hair down at that school that nobody's got any hair like you, that you're, you've got the best looking head of hair down at that school. And the next morning, I remember walking into that school and I said, there ain't a cat here got hair like me. <laughs> there ain't nobody got hair like mine. Let me tell you something, folks. Inside every man, there's still a little boy crying out for that woman's voice to say there's nobody like you. There's been so many times in my life when I've been so discouraged and so disheartened. And Barbara would say to me, you're going to do it. You're going to do it. I believe in you. I believe in you. Nobody in my family had ever graduated college. Nobody. Nobody. Many of them in prison. Many of them in jail. I remember the first degree the associate's degree. Barbara said, you can do it. You're smart enough. You're smart enough. You can do it. And I graduated from Covington Seminary and I stood right over there and I looked at R.H. Brown getting ready to give us the de degrees and I heard them announce an associate's degree, Vincent, Benny, Tate. And I looked out in that crowd and I saw a little black-haired girl get up named Barbara. And she kicked her arms out. And she said, that's my baby! <laughs> I tell you, every man is crying out for that voice of comfort. That voice to say, it's going to be okay. That voice to say that you can do it. That voice to say that I stand with you. If we lose everything, I'll be with you. If we file chapter 13, I'll be here. Let me tell you, third thing about the Holy Spirit. <laughs> He's counselor. <laughs> He's counselor. Look what the Bible says in John 16 and 13. He'll guide you in all truth. He's a counselor. Now begin to think about, what does a good counselor do? I'm not a good counselor, but what does a good counselor do? A good counselor listens. A good counselor listens. <laughs> you know, the average man uses 12,500 words a day. The average woman uses 25,000 words a day. <laughs> one, said, one man said, my wife and I had words, I just didn't get to use mine. If you're going to be the Holy Spirit like in your husband's life, you've got to learn to listen. Don't shut down his ideas. Don't shut down his dreams. Listen to what he says. Listen to what he don't say. Listen to his heart. The Holy Spirit is a companion. He's a comforter. He's a counselor. But let me tell you what else. He's a convictor. Look what John 16 and 7 and 8 says. And when he's come, he will reprove the world of sin. He's a convictor. You know, I read this week, if you're 48 years old and married, there's a 90% chance you'll live to be 65. 
If you're 48 years old and married, there's a 90% chance you'll live to be 65. But if you're 48 years old and single, there's only a 60% chance that you'll live to be 65. Why is it? I'll tell you why. Don't eat that. Don't drink that. (laughs) Slow down. Watch where you're driving. You get sick and she pets and she pampers you. She's the convictor. She's the convictor. When we don't listen to her wives, we miss 50% of what God's saying. She's the convictor. A counselor said to a wife, You need to embrace your mistakes. She reached over and hugged her husband. (laughs) Number five, concentration is on another. Concentration is on another. Look what John 16, 13, and 14 says. Jesus talked about the Holy Spirit. And he said, he shall glorify me. See, the Holy Spirit was in this service. He's in this service. But he doesn't glorify himself. He glorifies Jesus. The Holy Spirit's focus is not on himself. It's on Jesus. If we want to be the proper mate, we can't focus on ourselves. We've got to focus on our mate. See, it's childish to say, mine. A baby says, mine. When we focus on ourselves, that's not what God wants. In surgery for a heart attack, a middle-aged woman has a vision of God by her bedside. And she says to God, will I die? He says, no, you got 30 30 more years to live. With that in mind, while she's in the hospital, she gets a liposuction, a tummy tuck, (laughs) hair transplants, lip injections. She looks great. She's discharged. She exits. As she's leaving the hospital, an ambulance hits her and kills her. She gets to heaven. And she says, God, what happened? I thought I had 30 more years to live. God said, I didn't recognize you. (laughs) This week, I saw Mark Harmon, the actor, and Pam Dauber. Now, when I saw them, I didn't see them, you know. Both of them are 67 years old. Been married over 30 years. They said, what's the secret to your marriage? What's the secret to your success? Now, this is Hollywood. They said maturity. Maturity. We grew up. And when we grew up, our marriage got better. When we grew up, our marriage got better. Look what 1 Peter 3, 6 says. A lot of women don't like this verse because they don't understand it. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, you know what the word obeyed there means? It means to pay close attention to. To pay close attention to. The focus was not on me, it's on her. Focus is not on her, it's on him. To pay close attention to. Let me give you number six, and I'm done. Communication to God. Communication to God. Romans 8 and 26 says this, that the Holy Spirit prays to God. The greatest thing, listen closely, that you can do for your husband is not to nag him. 
but to pray for him. The greatest thing that you can do for your husband is not to nag him, but to pray for him. I'll tell you something. I had a sister, have a sister named Rhonda, and she used to enjoy watching a program called The Love Boat. There was an actor on the love boat. His name was Gavin McLeod. He was the captain. He was the captain of the love boat. He'd been on the love boat for about seven years, and he got caught up in all of it. And he decided that he would leave his family. And his wife, Patty, said, when he left for three solid years, I simply prayed for him. I simply prayed for him. And she said, I did something as an act of faith. Each night when I would set the table, I would set me a place and I would set him a place. And she said, after three years, a knock came on the door. And she said, Gavin was at the door. And I said to him, Gavin, come on in. Your dinner's getting cold. And she said, we remarried. And we've been together all these years. Let me tell you something. Ladies, the greatest thing you can do for your husband is pray for him. You and your husband are one flesh. And God's going to honor that prayer in a supernatural way. Men, we need our wives. And we need our wives to resemble the Holy Spirit.